Hey, guys. It's nice to see you. I just brought a couple of props with me. I have got a suit, so, you know, I am the authority figure here, and I do look good sometimes. And I brought a computer with all the usual things. Yeah. Uh, but we're going to throw those away, because I'm going to go fairly unplugged um, for a couple of reasons. We're here today to talk about deep everything, okay? And, and the, the whole theme of the concert, the concert is deep everything. And I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to see if your minds are working. And then after I've seen if your minds are working, we're going to talk about some things that are maybe somewhat controversial, because I'm possibly going to not agree with the fact that we're actually even here at the moment talking about this stuff. And I'm going to find out why you're here. And then we're going to reconstruct. I'm going to go, go, go through some technologies, and we're going to look at the way the next phase of, of existence carries on. Uh, but it'll come from my background, um, which you'll see in a minute. First of all, just before we get going, a uh, little test for you all. It's a very simple test. And most of you all know this, of course. I've got nine dots. I've got nine dots on a piece of paper. Those of you who've got a piece of paper in front of you, you've got a hand, you can write on it. What I'd like to see you do is join it together, join those nine dots together with four lines, which stay attached. They don't break. You never take the pen off the paper. Anyone know how to do it? So show, come and show me. You mean, you mean it was supposed to be done like kind of going from here and then going down there and then going down there and coming back across there like this? Yeah. It's easy, wasn't it? Four lines. So that's simple. Okay, I've got nine dots. Okay, get slightly more difficult. I want you to do it with three lines. Three lines, come on, simple. Just think. You never said the lines should be straight. Uh, the, the, so, so the side, sorry, the same thing, the, same, the, the, lines, the lines should join, never take the pen off. Well, you know, never, never, they should join and you can draw them. Think about the properties of lines and dots and things. Straight, Straight lines. lines. Yeah, do what you want with the paper. I like the paper, by the way, the way it is. It's, it's nice paper. Does it have to be uh, in two dimensions or in three? Take it to four if you want. It's not quite as hard as it looks, guys. There's no time continuum. We're not going to fold time on itself. We're not going to fold the paper on itself. We're just going to leave it like that, and we're going to do it. OK. So, there's a couple of solutions. One's a kind of icky one, physics. If you draw three parallel lines and take them to infinity, what happens to parallel lines at infinity? They meet, so they will be joined. But we'll take it a lot simpler than that. If I take my first line, okay, and I take it through the top of this one, through the center of this one and through the bottom of this one, and come back in the opposite direction through those, and come back in the opposite direction through those, and they'll stay straight. You've just joined it with three lines, and you've never taken the pen off the table. Okay? 
You're getting the hang of this now. Where do you think we're going to go next? And it ain't going to be five. Okay, we got nine dots. How do I join them with one line? Could, is my computer image up for the slides? The bigger pen that draws us one big line. That's exactly the answer. That is exactly the answer. The answer is take a big pen, go straight through it. Why do you think I'm talking to you about this stuff? I'm talking to you about this stuff because every time we face a, a problem that we have to solve, every time we confront a new technology hurdle, what we have to do is redefine the problem in a way in which we can answer it. So if I can't break into something, I get the people to come out. If I can't do something in one particular way, I modify the way in which I'm going to do it so that I change the rules of the game so that I can, I can break it. And every day in our life as technologists, we're faced with issues and things that we suddenly come up against. Oh, you can't do that. You know, you can't get a, a, a current to pass at this particular temperature. You can't get uh, this particular uh, amount of memory to do something. I'll give you an example. When I... My last but one company was a company called... By the way, is there anyone from Intel here? Good. Um, no. My last but one company in Timisoara, and I'll tell you a little bit about how I got there in a moment, but um, my last but one company in Timisoara, we built an eight-core multi-core chip with software and everything else. And when we built it, we thought that that chip was going to be very good to do fast transformations and handling things in parallel and that we could maybe, 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 maybe get to 720p, right? In terms of handling video in real time. By the time we finished with it, by some innovation and by changing the rules of the game, breaking things down into blocks and re-adding them, we got up to 1080i. And... Not only did we do that, but we actually also used that same chip at the same time in real time to crack the HDMI code for uh, TV, break into the signal, convert 2D to 3D, rehash the HDMI encryption on top of it, and send it to the TV. So we turned a, three, a 2D stream into a 3D stream onto an ordinary TV. We had n the maths at the beginning told us that there was no way that we could actually do it. But ingenuity and people found a way around that. Romanian people found a way around that. That's when I first kind of fell into love with Romanian technology and Romanian engineering. It was my first uh, real experience of it. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to... How do I get this? This is technologist. How do I get my picture to come up? Because my eyes are going. That's, by the way, that's the one thing. If you spend your whole lifetime building things on tiny devices, the eyes go. Excuse me, can somebody come in? Awesome. Come on then, show me. No, no, you're nothing like having IT here. Is anyone else an IT person? There we go. Ah, oh, thank you. Okay. 
yeah, this is me. I'm quite old. I've been around a bit. I started as a systems analyst in the 70s, 80s, and uh, working on mainframes, and working on accounting programs. And by the way, you live in a different era, so you don't know how boring that was. Once you've written one HP repayments program, and once you've written one accounting package program, and that's all these rooms full of computers can do, it gets incredibly boring for the next 20 years. Fortunately, I was good at sport, and I was playing professional sport, and I managed to be selected for the special air service in, in the UK, and uh, I went and spent 10 years playing soldiers and jumping through windows and doing all that kind of clever stuff, which taught me that analysis, the systems analysis part of me, made me a very good special forces soldier. So all of those guys here who play Rainbow Six and everything else on the game pads and everything, you could, if you could do all the other physical stuff, be very good special forces soldiers, because you're analytical, you solve problems, you act in real time, you handle things heads up, and you, you manage to find solutions to everything and always give yourself options. And that's what people do. Being a systems analyst, as I said, I walk into a bank, and when I walk into a bank, I look at the cameras and I look at everything else, and I think, how do I steal from this place? It's just a musing of the mind, but I'm looking to see where the cameras work, and then I'm looking to see how do I improve it? How do I make it better? So the good thing about that is I got to play with lots of really expensive technology, because there aren't many soldiers who've got a degree in computer science. So every time we got a new package of something that looked like, you know, Q's office from, from James Bond, it was like, Baz, can you tell us what this does? Yeah, I'll read the instructions. <laughs> uh, but I work with everything from nuclear bombs down to technology, suitcase bombs I'm talking about, through, down to technology, laser targeting, all the other things, burst transmission. I wrote the first one-time pad encryption system for the British Special Forces. Um, in real time, which helped me when I then came out of the forces and went to Sharp, where I, as it says here, I did, uh, what is it, 100 plus consumer electronics, over 100 million mobile phones and devices. Um, I did the first smartphone from Symbian, it was me. Uh, I wrote, built the first Apple Newton, which is the forerunner of the, all of the other Apple products that came along. I've i uh, done 50 applications on multiple mobile prop phones. I did this some because one day I got bored and I thought, well, how much did I ever earn in my life, you know, in terms of the thing? So I just added it up, and when you actually add it up, it's pretty impressive. I'd employ him. I wouldn't really. Okay. So, now let's tell you a little bit about... So that was a little bit about me. Oh, by the way, I didn't drop in that... In the process of this, and this is what we're talking about technology, so let me take you just this technology journey. So there was this systems analyst, and then in the 80s, there was a kind of a dead period, because we had these machines that were this big, and we actually managed to get them down to this big, and then we had this laughable thing of a portable computer at the beginning of the 90s. And the portable computer at the beginning of the 90s was about the size of that red box. No, this blue box. Cut it in two like that, you carried it over your shoulder, and you walked like that. And you got to the place where you're doing, you pull the keyboard off the front and you drop the, and you plugged it into the mains and it was portable. Well, it was luggable, as they called it. And then we got down to smaller devices and so on. Um, and I built also the first electronic organizer for Sharp called the Wizard or the Sharp IQ. And I got to play, I've been very lucky, I just got to play with lots of things before I went to do smartphones at, Sharp, at Philips. I worked for Bill Gates to try and teach Microsoft how to make mobile phones, because Bill saw the first smartphone and said, gee, how do I own this business? And I said, you need to buy Scion. And he went, oh. And then my bosses at Philips sold me to him for six months while we did a deal to try and buy Scion and acquire the technology to sell it to, new, to, to, to lease it to Microsoft so he could build phones. Unfortunately, <clears throat> Motorola and Sony and uh, Sony Ericsson and all the other guys heard about it through the pipeline, I think. A friend of mine leaked it to them. And they put 200 million each to make it so that you got Symbian instead. So then you had 10 years of Symbian. 
And that was the standard, wasn't it? Until our everybody's friend, Google, you know, because Microsoft was the devil and the demon, and we never wanted to work with Microsoft, and we all wanted to find our own things. But Google was the friendly face of it. Google wandered into town with Android and said, hey, guys, have this. It's free. Build your phones using our operating system. Any people here from Google? OK, I'll carry on telling the story then. <laughs> no, no, but what they did is they said to them, you know, they said, here it is, it's free. So you, now you don't have to worry about your own R&D. What you have to worry about is just take this from us, and you can put it into a phone, and it works perfectly, which it didn't, of course, because you had to rewrite half of it, and you had to do a lot of other things in it. Um, but what they did do is they stopped everybody else in the world, everybody else in the world, having their own R&D program which killed Siemens, which killed so many other people. Because what they did is they said, oh, cost down, 101 cost down. It's free, so we don't have to pay for all that R&D that gives us all that code. What they didn't realize, that the only things that Google work on were the Google apps and making sure you've got Google in every phone. Everybody missed that one. It's a bit like with, do you remember the Russians? The Russians and the Americans in the Cold War? The Americans couldn't get anything into, a, into, into Moscow, in, into Russia. They spent 20 years trying to do it. Ronald McDonald wanders right into the middle and gets, sets up a shop in the middle of there. And Ronald McDonald, and there's queues of hundreds of Russians stood outside wanting to queue up for Ronald McDonald and capitalism. It's just the way things go. But it's also, put it away in your mind, because we're talking about evolving technology and what happens. Okay? Because there's a pattern to all of these things. Things are the standard, and then there's another one. Things are the standard, and then there's another one. Americans have one view of a standard, right? They have a collaborative standard. So if I think about a hard standard, it's Etsy. You know, in Etsy, the telecom standard, everybody sits in a room like this. There's probably 50 of us. We're talking about one line at a time of the thing, and everybody has to agree with it to get it into the standard. And you keep the standard, and it's rigorous, and it'll work on every country on the planet. And you can take your mobile phone everywhere, and you can make it roam. The American standards are where people get together in a loose role and agree that they're going to push a technology, and they invent a way of doing it, and then they all try to superset each other to get a competitive advantage. And it lasts for 6 to 12, 18 months, and then that standard goes, and it falls. Because a, a person has come out with Intel or whoever with one that's a de facto standard, that, that wins the market. So you've got de jure standard, de facto standard. Again, it's important looking at new technology and the evolution of technology. Why is it important? That defines whether you are global or not. Whether the system is for people or whether it's for purely about making profit for the company and, 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 and not, not at all shared. So we hear a lot about sharing. You know, we hear about, for example, you know, there's a lot of people that are taking shared software. You know, we, we were all talking about collaborative use of software. I mean, when you put open source software into one of your products, how many people put open source software into their products? Uh-huh. Fucking hell, you're jet and excuse language, guys, but you are very, very high risk takers. That software, that openware software could actually have been written by a 12-year-old lad sat in a, his bedroom somewhere. Hmm. If it had been written for me when I was 12 years old, I wouldn't have wanted to buy it. But it, it, you, know, you just don't know where it comes from. You've got, you, you're kind of saying, hey, it's okay, and it's good, and it's, it's, and it's a bit like the Android one. Yeah, it's fine. But what happens with, go back to Android, what happens when Google... Nobody's got competition anymore because Google, uh, Android is, is now the definitive operating system apart from Apple, okay? And Android is in more devices. What happens when the day that, and they tried it once, by the way, they said that they were never going to build mobile phones. And then if you found out after HTC, when they went to Motorola, I was in Motorola at the time, the, the instructions were, well, you don't change anything inside the code, but we're going to build our own phone. And we'll have it first, and it will go into the market before everybody else is. And then the others will get what we offer 
they'll get the same offering as us, which gives you no competitive advantage and nothing else. Which is why, and I'm just taking you on a journey, Samsung had a team of 500 people and did hundreds and hundreds of man years taking ice cream and never took a later version of the software. Because what they do is they built, they rewrote everything the way they wanted it and to rewrite it for every release of the software because Google's going to offer you the next thing, it's an impossible situation. So what they used to do with people like me is they used to pay me 22 million a year to rewrite my software to fit into theirs instead of them rewriting their software to fit with mine when I made a new release. I used to work for a company called TTPcom who supplied 43% of the world's protocol stacks for, soft, uh, for GSM and, 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 and mobile phones. And I learned there that actually the, the mechanics of it, you know, how do you get this thing? How do you get your technology out there? What is going to get you to the, the place you want to be? It's not just about technology. It's about the whole offering. It's about what's going to succeed. The best thing doesn't always succeed. You do know that Betamax was better than VHS. You do know the reasons why Betamax failed and VHS succeeded. Do you? How many people are old enough to remember Betamax and VHS? Oh, God, this is going to be hard. Um, OK, there were two standards for video recording in the days before we had CDs, in the days before we, we streamed it live and everything else. One was Betamax by Philips, and the other was VHS, which came from a Japanese conglomerate okay, of teams. And what won it? Because this, this also goes back to what makes us tick with IoT with everything else. What makes applications sell? Why does it work? <sighs> what won it? Sony did a deal and got all the porn films on VHS. Sex is a key driver. You, you know about key drivers in, in, in software, and we're all techie, but there are key drivers. So I won't pay for anything that's not important to me. But there are some core things as apps and, and things that I do that are key to me. And those things are sport. I'll have a sport. Mine's rugby. OK, obviously, the way I'm built, that's the way I am. Um, some of these might be football, some of these might be netball or hockey or swimming or whatever. We will buy an app or have apps, read apps that have got that, that suspension of disbelief for us. That, that's important to us. If we have music, some of you will like opera, some of you will like rock, some of you will like reggae, some of you will like, I don't know, chamber music, whatever it is. And we'll split the group. Again, we'll, you know, your hands up, we'll get a diffuse group, and we'll understand it. We're almost getting to Amazon now, because once we start to know where those groups dissect and the age groups of those people, we start being able to sell things to them, because we offer them things that they want, because they fit into a demographic, and we've got marketing ideas. But sex is the best seller of all. It's the key driver, it's one again, these nine key drivers. Sex is a key driver. Shall I tell you how it was proven that sex was a key driver? In the back of newspapers, you know, in the days when we had newspapers, does, hang on, who remembers newspapers? <laughs> so I'm, I'm just trying to not feel so old here. Okay. Right, we remember newspapers. I used to put fish and chips in them and eat it, because I remember it. Read the sports page. I always read a newspaper from the back, sport, and then I get forward to the other things at the front. They were kind of less important to me. Um, but newspapers at the back used to have an ad section. Okay? And in that ad section, there would be four pages of sex ads. Phone me, call this line, do this, do that. Those ads get paid for. They're not there because they're not, nobody's calling them. There was more sex ads than there was anything else. The very first internet applications that made money, what was it? No? Sex. Um, it was. All the guys who were publishing the sex magazines started licensing the images, and I met some of them. I mean... 
I, it, was in, it was really strange because you go to see this piece and they say, we want to computerize this. And I, I actually got this happen in, in, in one time. I went along to ask them and I walk in and I, I kind of sit down and they said, okay, so you're in publishing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We publish the top 50 magazines in the UK for sex. Okay. And what do you want me to do with them? We'd like you to put them online. We'd like you to... And I, okay, well, that's an interesting job. Um, you could go blind doing it, but, um, but we actually, you know, catalog, but the, the thing is, the business case was real because people would pay for it. Therefore, they could afford to pay me two or $300,000 to do it. And it only happens if there's an economic pull through. So the very first apps were always sex, and the, very, and the very first thing, or things to do with sex, even selling in shops was to do with things that you could order in brown packages and, and things like that. And I'm not preambling on, I'm not focusing on sex, but you have to have key drivers. There has to be reasons why people buy them. There's hundreds of really good technologies that have ended in the bin. How many products have you had that you've, you've bought it, Three weeks later, it's in the, it goes in the drawer and you don't touch it again. I, I spent my whole life, first, when I came into this business, working in, in, in Philips and, 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 and with Sharp, those first 10 years in the, in the 90s, I had technologies years ahead of me. I was working with, so I was working with pens that you could pull out and there was a thin film uh, image on the screen, on a TFT screen that was, that was done. You know the Vodafone now do this... Uh, um, Holograph on 5G, right? Sharp had that in 1993. In 1994, I built something called a PT60, size of an A5 book, had a screen that you could pull out, just pull around, touch screen, um, had a hard disk drive that you could put inside it, a little PCMCIA hard disk drive you slide in, you could plug a keyboard into it with the big DIN plug. You could power it by batteries. It was portable. It had a pen-based system you could write on. The only difference between it and an iPad of today was 15 years, and about that thick in terms of the size of the components that it was needed to, to make it to work. I still have it at home. I sit it on my desk. It's just sat there as a reminder that one of those that didn't make it, you know, the evolutionary branch where it gets there, it was good, and it had databases and word processors and everything else on it, but there were no apps, because of course the internet didn't really exist at that stage. And it's about, again, another word, timing. So deep technology is amazing, but if you look at all the deep technologies that people are talking about today, they existed 20 years ago. All the things that you're doing today pretty much existed 10, you know, 10 years ago. We laugh now when we see rockets from the 1930s films. You know, with the guy, and he's pulling the switch, and it's arcing, and it's electricity, and there's all that kind of stuff, and, the, and the big dials of pressure dials and things like that. And we look at that, and we laugh. But if you only look 10, 15 years ago, and you actually see it 20 years ago, it was that dark. Yeah? I'm going to ask you a question. How long have you had picture messaging on your mobile phone? How long have you been able to get picture message on your mobile phone? Anyone? Eight years? Eight years? Mm -hmm. Go on. Anyone else? <laughs> I got who was alive when picture messaging was first started? And I've just I've gone back to my phone. No? Okay. I have a personal reason for asking this. In 1999, I was sat in a bar in Paris. I was working for Philips on the back of a napkin, I was thinking about the issue of SMS and packets. And that the SMS is a 265 byte packet. Two, uh, 256 byte packet, right? It is. Lose one. You've got a data header marker. You've got various things in the front end, the first 17 bytes. And then you have things called a user data header. Do you know what? You can drop things into that user data header to make a packet. And it takes it away from the rest of the packet. And you can put a command code in the front of that that tells the, the, when you open it and read it at the other end, 
interprets that and says, this that follows is a this or a that or a command or a whatever. And so, on the back of this beer mountain napkin, I designed packet transfer for messaging. And then I went to my boss at Philips just before Christmas, two days before Christmas, and I said to him, can I have a meeting? And he said, yep. He said, I've had this idea and I've been working on it, and I just want to run it past you. And I showed him what you could do if you embedded things into messages and if you embedded things into streams in the, in the GPRS stream, embedded things in. And I said, and we could do all of these things. We can make phones now flash on screens and we can make messages arrive and we can make clever things happen on them. And he was like, mm hmm. And he was a Dutch guy, so he didn't move much. He just kind of just. Mm -hmm. And no, because Dutch, Dutch guys are great because they're brilliant. They get commerce, they get everything, and they get engineering. But they don't, you know, they don't get jumpy up and downy and yay, whippee. You know, it's not like the Americans. Hoo ah, let's go. Um, it's kind of very, uh huh. How much is this going to cost me? Um, and I got to page 16 in a 64 page slide deck two days before Christmas. And I knew when I walked out of that room, I was either going to be fired or I was going to get what I wanted. Or I was leaving, actually, because I was going to do it on my own. And I said to him, he said, OK, Barry, I get it. It's not rocket science. You've got rabbits jumping out of hats. You've got images appearing on screens. Duh, 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 duh. I get it. You've got photos. I said, yeah. He said, uh, what do you want? I said, two million. I want you to give me two million. I want you to send me back to England, steal my team from Sharp. I'll form a company. Philips can't sell it to all the other handset manufacturers. But I can, because I'm small. You keep the IPR. We'll drive an IPR wedge into a phone. I'm going to talk IPR wedge. Very important. When you're going to make a footprint with new technology, make sure you've got an IPR wedge to drive in. You then open the IPR wedge up, and you control the IPR that's inside it. Always make your apps have their own IPR. By the way, this is you know, all this concept of open systems and all that. Yeah. You put something in, you give it away to everybody else, but you keep the IPR from it. The original five GSM members all owned shared IPR, which cost everyone else who wanted to make a phone, apart from Philips, Philips, Motorola, Sony, uh, sorry, Ericsson, Nokia, and Alcatel. Apart from those guys, everybody else who wanted to make a phone had to pay a $5 surcharge for that IP, which made them less competitive. Because if you think about bomb cost of a mobile phone being less than $100, they can't even play in the, in the low-cost phone market, which is the highest volume market, which is the $35, $40 bomb cost, because they've got a five-gold surcharge, and that, that puts them price-wise way out of it. And that's why the only people who could ever make a success of it in the early days were those people, because they had a, a monopoly of the market, even though GSM, Global System Mondial, was Global System Mondial. I hope what I'm talking to you about is, you know, I'm not setting you a test and, and showing you and, and showing you lots of slides and telling you, but what I'm trying to take you is a journey through what it is and teach you the things that made it get to where it is. So that when we get to today, we can look at the problem of today and we'll be able to sort of, you'll have a brilliant inspiration, maybe, um, <laughs> or I'll have a brilliant inspiration. Um, we'll have brilliant inspiration, and we'll maybe look on the board and we'll, we'll solve the problem. Or we won't. We'll, we'll find another way of not doing it. Okay? But, so we go through to this. My boss gave me the money. Good. I formed a company called Magic Four. I went back to England. 10, 15 guys. We grew to 120 guys. We got it into 26 handsets in the first six months. We wrote the client software that went inside it, and we wrote the server software for delivering the services to it. We thought the money was going to be, and again, I thought the money was going to be, and we'd take a charge on the services being delivered. Right? And this is how all technologies twist at the end, because what you build the thing for in the first place is very often not what it actually ends up being the thing for. You know? When I built my multi-core chip, 
we thought it was going to be doing some, something really worthy, and, and, and we ended up making 3D video. And, and now it's in robotics, and now it's in Google's on AI platform. It actually underpins Google's AI platform for deep learning. Um, look up Movidius Intel, you'll see it. But that's a Romanian company, group of less than 100 guys here in Romania who showed the world how to do it. Now, so we got them, 26 people to do it. It was, uh, it was a mixture of you know, things. We got, how did we get Motorola? Again, this is again how, how work, it works. My ex-boss was the head of Motorola's mobile phone division. Um, he went on to be that. He invented, his team put the razor together. And I went to see him and said, hey, I've got this. And because I'd done things for him before that were successful, he kind of said, OK, I'll give it a go. What, do you, what can you do? And we took one of those little flat star a pager, GSM pages, and we actually got a message into the war room where Chris Galvin, the, the owner of, of Motorola, used to have every Monday morning. And Chris got a ring on his telephone. He opened this telephone up, and a baseball player hit a baseball out towards him, and it said Cubs on it. Chris Galvin owned the Cubs, and his words, I think, were, shit, we're going to own this. And so the next day, we signed the deal with them. Um, and, we, and they also invested five more million in us. So I raised 10 million from the city. I went and did that. And we, what, the truth is, I took it to standards, and that's why I'm talking about standards being so important. Etsy, I took it to standards. I got it into Etsy ahead of the Nokia offer because I put a 345, a 2345 play in place where I got all the other four, five guys. I got Ericsson, Motorola, Alcatel, Siemens. I got them all to back me in the meetings. And so I do remember this one moment when the, uh, and I had Vodafone, the chairman was from Vodafone, and he sat up and he said, okay, we need to vote on the proposal for adding picture messaging into GSM standard. I always remember it because the candidate, the guy from Nokia was always stood at the front. And by the way, Nokia said to anyone work for Nokia? I'm, I'm, I'm on a run here. I'm on a run. Because, okay. He said to me something like, I always remember, he says, we went to Nokia and we said, hey, we've got this new technology and we can do this and you can make messages. And he, yes, we had our own standard. And it looked like he'd stood in me, like I kind of was a piece of poo on the floor and he was just, oh, we, have our, we have our own standard. It's okay. I always remember that because also my CTO was from, Norix and, uh, from Nokia and he said to me once, Barry, he said, Barry, you're a really smart guy here, but in Nokia you'd be ordinary. Or in Finland you'd be ordinary. I thought, oh, it's great to know where I am. Anyway, I'll just enact this scene for you. So, and this was the one of the best moments of my life. All sat back, there's 160 of us in the auditorium. Nokia guys at the front of, okay. All those in favor of the Nokia proposal. And he looks at Telenor, and the guy from Telenor's sitting still. And he looks around, and there's nobody moves in the room. <laughs> and I was sat at the back of the room, actually falling off my chair. Because um, I knew the guy quite well, and we had a good battle about it. Those in fa favor of the Magic 4 proposal, and everyone stood up, and it's in the standard. And once it's in the standard, that's it. You're guaranteed to print the money. But we didn't make the money out of, and we gave the technology away. I, by the way, I gave away the, the IPR, except that Philips kept the IPR, but we gave them an irrevocable license forever and ever and ever. But only those people who used it through that. And what we did is, and this again is important in terms of how you, you think about this new technology evolving, the look, it's a bit like Darwinian theory, you know, some of it, you go down branches and it doesn't work, it does work, it, you, you've got to figure that not your first proposal is going to work. I thought we were going to make millions off the throughput, you know, for the click rate of the, of the messages going through. That was where our money was going to be. Guess what? The money was made out of selling clients and importing and, and implementing them in the, in the phones because we were ahead of everybody else. So it became a standard. I was the only one who had a client to go in. So the standard, they all want to go to, they all want to, go to uh, the GSM Congress in the February and say, hey, we've got this new feature. And of course, they can't do it. So then they have to pay me and my company to, to do it. 
So we sold the company after three years for 84 million to OpenWave, who then did some various other things, and then we bought OpenWave back from the OpenWave. And anyhow, we had some fun with the technology that went in and that now you use every day. And it's evolved and it's got lots of things to it now. And we can do, you know, now we do virtually everything on our mobile phone. You know, we track our lives on our mobile phone. But that's where it started. And that technology leap then led other people to thinking, okay, well, let's, let's incrementally make it. Let's do this and let's do this, let's do this. And you've got two ways. You know, people are talking to us about deep technology. Deep technology. I, I looked it up. I had to look it up. Didn't know what it meant. Um, and it says, innovation and innovative technology that has a deep impact and is going to make step changes in technologies, novel and, and so on. And so I started to go through all of the deep technologies I'd seen, seen illustrated. None of them are new. You can make them work now, but none of them new. So there is a place for the in, you know, incremental improvement. Find something, use it in a slightly different way. That's why the Japanese are followers, fast followers. What they do is they take what you've got and they make it a little bit better. The, the, you know, the guys from Samsung make it even, and LG do even that. They are Japanese, the Japanese. So when you're looking at a roadmap and you're trying to create this, look for where you're going to find the holes in this technology, how do you do it? What you do is, you rub your face like that. What you do is, first of all, you sensitize yourself to what's happening. So you research the whole background market, look at the things that can happen, the connections between things, and then let your brain figure how those connections work. I don't know, can, you, you guys can do it, I'm sure you can. You can take technologies and, you can, and, and things and you can kind of move them around in your head so that you see the connection between things and, and kind of figure out that if I put that and that and that together, I can make that. Now, it may not be the answer, but it's one of the opportunities you've got. You know, and you can make that and you can make that. And some companies back those 20 options and go shotgun at it and see which one t takes, takes hold. That's the Japanese style. Some people look at the golden product and just drive through on this one concept. That's the going out of business style. Um, because you either have to completely subvert the market I mean, for instance, you know that Apple was a fluke. Yeah? You do know that Apple was a fluke. Apple was going down, was going down that way. It had less than 8% uh, operating system share in, the, in, in, the, in devices. It was basically heading for the toilet. The iPod wasn't the first device that could do playing music. What it had was a sexy design. And the nano iPod had a sexy design you could put in the gym, and it was an accessory. Apple, if doesn't develop iPod, is out of business. You know? This was not Steve Jobs' brilliant, masterful, you know, strategic guy, because he'd screwed the company three times already. You know, Apple won and the Mac, he divisively broke, got rid of, you know, damaged all the people, which is when Gary Wozniak left. He'd screwed it with the shops when Apple was, had this, you had to buy a $300,000 shop frontage and it could always look in the Apple style. I love the Romania the way it's done. I, I think it's brilliant. It's kind of Apple ish. It's white and it's got the things, but they, they actually aren't Apple stores. Um, but then you wouldn't want to waste the money on it. But you had to buy this facade, and it had to be in a high street location. It had to be this, because Apple was special. Apple was design. Apple was presence. It's an art form. And Jobs believed his own Kool-Aid. Um, and you might say, do I, do, am I talking? I knew Steve Jobs, and I knew um, Bill Gates. I met, I bet, and worked, well, known, bet, and worked with them. Steve Jobs I didn't like, <laughs> you may gather. Um, Whereas Bill Gates, I thought, was a lovely man. He's a really nice guy, and he, he understood the things he didn't know, and he, he did stuff. Steve was, was kind of a much more, you take him or you leave him kind of character. Um, but, again, it was a fluke, because the market made that happen, because people liked the design of the white, the, the, just the nice pebbly look that it had. 
Samsung and LG had got, and the giant Japanese guys had been having MP3 players for ages. Then they did the bit with the uh, licensing, again, the licensing deal, and, and tried to create a, a walled garden. And again, I'm talking to you about you're going to develop innovative technologies. Do you open it up to everybody, or do you create a walled garden and control everything within it? Controlling everything within it. You know, I have my own series of apps. I have my own things that you can do. And it's Apple this, and it's this, and this. And they don't work with anybody else's. There's no interoperability. Do you know what? I've got my own IoT products, but they only work with Apple IoT products. And I know, you know, you've got your own, and every company's got their own ones. Guess what? It doesn't work. That doesn't work. The, the wall garden doesn't work. You try to own everything, you end up owning a small percentage of a small percentage. And Apple wasn't going anywhere other than that. Its mobile phones were not mobile phones when they first shipped them. They were awful. The radio antennas, uh, the, the antenna attenuation was... Absolute rubbish. They didn't work well as phones. They worked well as a device to play music and to, to, to do pictures on. But they looked slick and clean. You know? Then the Razer comes along and that attacked it because the Razer had that sexy... The Razer was a 20-year-old was a phone, by the way. What's in a Razer was... You know, if you go... Razer, Motorola, they build products for engineers. You can get down to level 23 on some of the menus in a, in a Motorola phone on P2K. I know, because I've been there. You can set settings for the network in it. <laughs> no person in the right mind is going to want to go down there. But some engineer, when he was designing it, thought, it's engineer design. We're going to have one of those. So you can just, because on that one moment when I'm stood on the end of a window ledge and I can't get a signal, and I need to just quickly connect, I can do it. And he got in the phone. I mean, how the hell did he get in the phone? I don't know. But just talking it through. So Razer, again, sexy. It was the period of the sexy phones. Looked look nice, but didn't do a lot. And at one point, after two years, there were still only 8 million no, uh, um, uh, phones from Apple out there. It's a small number, and it was very small. And in fact, if, if Android had have come two or three years earlier, it would have wiped it out completely again. But it's there and it's here, but it's not changing very much, is it, from, from time to time? What are you getting? Bigger screens? Do you know what? It's, they used to say about mobile phones, it's the only thing where you'll hear a man talking to another man in a toilet saying, mine's smaller than yours. And we took them right the way down to being like this, and little devices and on there, and now we're taking them back up to be bigger. And bigger, and bigger, and bigger, and bigger, and you can get a big one, you know? It's trend. It, 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 go, it goes in cycles, and it goes like so. And you've all seen the ones about adoption of technology. You know, you get, you get, it sweeps up into the amazing heights of everybody's hyping it, and then drops into the valley of despair, and then it comes back up again, and you have three or four ripples like that. And if you've survived till the end of it, you're lucky. And you get, you get the winner. And the technology arrives. If you can hang around long enough, the technology window will catch up with you. But it's been able to survive. So some people just do the innovation and then either sell it as a component to other people to get it out there so that they can enable other people. That's the least aggressive way of doing it and it allows your technology to get out. Or they put it on the back burner and say, OK, we're going to save that for 10 years' time. That's, that'll come again. It'll have its time. We'll evolve it in a different way. And there's different technologies that you do it in different ways. Now, so God, we're nearly up to 92,000. We're doing well. And already what we've seen is, you saw analog to digital. Do you know, again, there was no reason for switching from analog to digital at the time that they did it. The only reason they switched from analog to digital is they made more money out of it because they're selling more infrastructure. They needed, so why does the mobile phone industry work and sell more phones? Because, believe it or not, and again, I'm old enough to remember it, in the old days, you know, when you bought, when you were a network operator and you bought a networking infrastructure set, guess what it was packed with? Mobile phones. Famous story, Ericsson used to pack mobile phones in with it because you have to have something to use with it. Because what they wanted to sell was they wanted to sell you the infrastructure. Because you got a fortune for infrastructure and mobile phones you only made a small margin on. 
but you needed the mobile phones to make the calls, so people would buy the infrastructure, so give the phones away. So in that case, did that technology really win, or was it just, we all just got conned? You know? For a long time, for a long time, GPRS was better than 3G. It was more mature, it worked, you could get things to send in it. You thought your 3G was iffy at best. So sometimes we get sold pups and we get sold in a way that we actually believe it and we believe the hype. And, and, it, and it survives, sometimes it dies. Now, as we come into this next decade, we're starting to get to the decade of data. And this is, this is kind of where I came into it because when, when I was in Philips, I was the head of, uh, of all products that were not voice, they were about data, that had data in them. And that's been my background, is, is data. So what can you connect to what? How do you make this work with that? Guess what? Internet things. Internet things is about joining things together, isn't it? Yeah? You get that? There was a little chip that was made, 1998. I worked on it. What was it called? Named after some... Some Swedish king, no, Danish king. Oh, yeah, Harold Bluetooth. I remember pitching that as, for Corbynshire, the, the chairman of Philips, when we told the world we were going to connect all of their home together with this. So here was my scenario. You have your mobile phone. You walk into the house. Your house, it switches from the mobile network to the home network because it just bridges across. You now can either pick a handset up and talk about it on your handset, saving your battery, because in those days, batteries mattered. You can walk around the house. You can talk to the speakers, and you can hear it while you're walking around the house. You can have your TV linked to it. You can have all of the things that you can do with it. Is it starting to sound familiar? Because it's been reinvented now 20 years later. Maybe 20 years is the cycle time. But Bluetooth was going to be the great joiner. It allowed you to go in your car, and as you drove towards the house in your car, you could set things off in your car, you could set things off there, you could do it. Small drawback, small drawback. It only worked for eight meters, which was a bit difficult. Didn't go through walls. Um, so maybe the hype was a bit more than the actual reality of it. But we had all of the same scenarios worked out that we had for IoT in those days. It's just it couldn't deliver. One of the scenarios was, I'm on a mobile phone, I'm walking, something I said. <laughs> um, we have mobile phones, we walk along past a shop, and I'm walking past the shop, and my Bluetooth recognizes the, the, the window, the shop, it sends a message across to it saying, hey, I'm pairing with you, it says, hey, Barry, we've got this on sale for you. Which is a bit embarrassing if it's something I don't want everybody else to see, of course, but I, we never thought about that one. But, but they, you know. Um, and there it is, making me an offer in the shop. We had all of those scenarios worked out 20 years ago. We just couldn't execute it. Okay? One, we needed the internet to be much, much faster. And we needed it to be more rigorous and reliable. We needed conditions to change, but they have changed now, and then, so we're readdressing it. So we go through the, the noughties, and what we see in the noughties is we see more data services, applications become king, and APIs become king. You know, Bill Gates used to say in the 90s, I remember him saying to me, I said to him, why does... Because I, I, what I had to do is they gave me the impossible task, one of those impossible tasks, which was make the um, make the, the operating system that they got, the non-real-time operating system they got, work with a mobile phone. Okay? And basically, <laughs> I found out they hadn't got a 20-second millisecond, a 20 millisecond clock. There's a bit of technical stuff there. Yeah, you've got your technical stuff. And there was no 50 millisecond clock, which meant you couldn't do fax, you couldn't do, you couldn't do messaging, you couldn't get some, hook onto some of the services, which made it pretty impossible for you then to make a compelling mobile phone offering, which if you remember, in the early, in the early 2000s, I told them, no, you can't do it. 
and sure enough, they couldn't do it. So they, they went away for a bit and, and reinvented their low-end uh, the, low operating systems to try and make them work with mobile phones, to make them more real-time. And it took them nearly 10 years to get there. Um, a friend of mine actually did build a couple of phones for them with it, but uh, then they bought Nokia instead. Uh, now, if you think about that, it was Microsoft. Then all the other big players were having a go. We haven't got to Amazon yet. Amazon's not starting to come through. Google's not starting to come through yet. But what we're getting is we're starting to see the data services coming together. We've got large amounts of data. We're starting to see data mining happening with data warehousing, big star. We're starting to see people trying to understand what you have and what you buy and what you're trying to do. Then a Google come along and Amazon come along. And Google starts to track absolutely everything you do on a, mobile, on, on a mobile device and on your home device. And you happy doing it because it's telling you where to find something on the internet. Just you don't think about the fact that it knows exactly what you went to and where you went to and why you went to. And the Data Protection Act's not really in place in those days. And so they know more about you than you really ever want anyone to know. And even they could be tracking your passwords and things like that, and you, you didn't know. Nobody knew because we never really thought about it. And besides, we weren't spending a lot of money on it because we weren't ready for that yet. And it wasn't until Amazon came along and really started to shopping and, and invested. I mean, and do you remember Amazon at the beginning made losses for year upon year, hundreds of millions. People said, well, where are they going to make the money from, from, from having this frontage? And then suddenly... It clicks, the, the technology gets into place, we've got secure billing, we've got the ability to pay for things easily, and suddenly, again, like Ronald McDonald in Moscow, we're all, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I hold my hand up, 450 things last year off Amazon. I'd buy my groceries off them if I could, be, you know, just they delivered it. Because, and I'll tell you why, I trust them, in this sense. I trust them because I bought a colour TV off them 3D TV, when I was doing the research and, uh, for making 2D TVs in 3D. I bought a Panasonic TV, and it was, after about four weeks, it died. I phoned up a little man at the other side. I always remember his name was Salmon. Don't know where he was from, uh, but his name was Salmon. And I said, uh, excuse me, and he said, oh, that's okay, Mr. Jones, no problem at all. Uh, just print out this label, ch -ch -ch stick it on that, Another TV will be with you tomorrow. You just give the guy the, the other TV that you just bought. He put it in the box. He'll take it away and hope it's all right. And I went, now that is customer service. It was a £900 TV, and they sent another one out to me. He said, and if you're not there, they'll, they'll leave it, and, and you just send the other one back when you want, you just, when you're ready. We're not worried. No quibble, no anything. You've got hooked me. I'm, I'm in. I, I, I'm, I believe. I know you're not going to cheat me. You might do a lot of other things to me, but I know you're not cheating me. And I've had the pleasure of working with those guys since, and, 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 and it's interesting the way they do it. It's the, the, the technologies, the way they're involving, taking it, buying Alexa. I've worked on Alexa mainly, because um, one of my friends is a senior, a senior director of it. Um, and it's good. It's, but voice we had years ago. Again, I was doing talking to mobile phones in the 90s. Say your name, it comes back and does it. We had a system for Philips in the 90s, which was you take the mobile phone, you say the keywords into it, whatever you want, football, da 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 and the website comes back to you. The, the highlighted website or the, you know, the one that's been advertised or the one that's been paid for came back to you. We had the whole thing. For, it's for the 2000 European Football Championship. We did it as a launch, and we just ran it up as a, as a research program. So, again, not a new technology. The, the, the concept of a warehouse is not a new t technology. There's nothing new in how you actually build the things together. It's, it's all dog standard. And I know this because in my latest business, I'll tell you what I do. Um, but uh, we've not hit, has anyone heard anything that was new so far? Everything has got a pattern of being, it was there, it was there, it was there. Or it's an innovation based on something else. You know? So... You shouldn't, when people talk to you about deep learning, you think you've got to do something really worthy. And I actually looked up what the top 25 deep learning thing topics were in the world this year. Mm. 
nothing that sexy, nothing I really, I'd be using. There was a lot of, there was some medical stuff, obviously. There was some robotic stuff, obviously. But it, there was nothing there where I was looking at it and going, wow, gee, that is, woof. I never thought about that one. I never saw that one coming. So you all have it in you to create this stuff, right? So let me ask you, I'm just going to just do a little questionnaire here. A little questionnaire. How many people work for companies and they, their company is an extension of an expatriate company? It's a country company somewhere else. Yeah, like an Intel or somebody. Or do, do, do. A multinational. How many? Hands up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. How many of you get to design the products from scratch here in Romania? So you come up with the innovations and get to go with it, yeah? Or they send you a kind of design outline and the architects of there have told you, hey, we want to build this, and you then make it happen. Uh, oh, yeah, you make the application, but did you come up with the ideas and do you actually... Do you actually design the product or design the architectures around it or whatever? Or does that come from Germany or France or America or wherever it is? Hmm? You reuse them. No, it's okay. It's okay. No, it's okay. It's, it's not a problem. I, the reason is I've had a single crusade because I actually happen to think that Romanian engineers are as good as any engineers in the world. And I'll show you a, little, a couple of slides a little bit later on that prove it, uh, that show it. Um, just checked. Yeah, you're here till week next Thursday, is that correct? <laughs> now, what we're getting now is we're getting the, the next group of things. Let's look at the Internet of Things, okay? The Internet of Things. We're starting to talk about connecting again and connecting again. So the obvious one is you're going to connect your phone to your PC, then you're going to connect your phone to, you're going to use your phone to control things over the, over the, the cloud. And we're going to use the cloud as an integrator. I, one of my previous companies, Next Put One, we did Spotify. We actually created Spotify to all the speakers in the world. So Sonos and everybody else's speakers. We connected it up there. You play, choose your playlist. It goes down to the spot of the device and you can control your device. So, you know, you're working with these nice companies like Spotify. They're really clever and, and cool and sexy and, and, and really good fun. And so we're doing that bounce stuff. We're doing the medical stuff. We're doing the looking at each other and checking on things stuff. We're doing the monitoring stuff. We're doing the, the spatial awareness stuff. Where are they in the house? Where, you know, is she fallen down? Has she moved? Have the sensor's been gone? To, yeah, we're doing that stuff. We're doing the car stuff. You know, turn the car into an internet node and then have it controlled. Then we're doing the car stuff driving, which in Romania actually would be better than drivers in Romania. Um, Sorry, guys, but Romania has some of the best and some of the worst drivers in the world. You'd be great in a rally. You should go, to, go into international rallying because going down the high street in, uh, in Timisoara and watching guys slide across in front of me in both directions and one over the top, that's, that's a different level of, uh, of awareness. I mean, talk about action sports. <laughs> Surviving is... I, how, the, how, the, how the hell your, your sort of 16-year-olds get to 25? I have no idea. <laughs> If you were in England, you'd get wiped out. Guy goes straight through you, boom, bang, gone. But they kind of, there's a lot of beeping, and I love that. You know, I think it's a sign that you've got a new one for Christmas, horns. Beep, 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 beep. You know, it's that whole play. <laughs> but we're controlling the cars. We're, we're making things happen. We're basically, every bit, we're taking the house. I mean, I went to IFA about four years ago, and I'd been talking about the kitchens being the home, the center of the home, and those things that you could do. I mean, I've always, I, you know, I see the home connection in a slightly different way. I thought that, um, you know, I thought that fridges were really cool, you know, to connect to the internet, do the, to cook the, you know, you put the thing in and you know how long it's been in there because I'm one of those guys who fills his fridge and then about three weeks later throws it all into the bin and don't bother eating it. It's good for my diet and it uh, keeps me active. Uh, but I forget everything that's in at the back, and it's gone frozen at the back, and I'm just, oh, I didn't. I bought one of those. That's a Christmas pudding from last year. Oh, let's throw that. Um, so the controlling of it and the automatic ordering, I mean, the idea that I can go on my phone and I can go, hey, hon, I'm uh, sure I have spaghetti bolognese tonight, and the fridge says back, hi, uh, you need to call and get some tomatoes. <laughs> We've got the 
the onions are a bit off. Uh, you know, da, 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 tells me what I've not got in the fridge, and I can get it, and I can go home and cook. So that kind of stuff works. I've got the television, and I can do the doorbell, so I'm deaf. So it says ring, ring on my TV because it interrupts. My cooker tells my TV that I've uh, finished cooking because I've set the, thing, the, ho- the, the oven on, and I've gone to watch a film, and it just says, dinner ready, pops up on my screen. I get that. I get all the messaging stuff you can do around the house. I've obviously worked on uh, wireless st- uh, stereo systems and so on because that's what my comp- Frontier Silicon, my company, did. And we did the thing, room, um, being able to surf from room to room. As I walked from room to room, this speaker switches on, that switches off, and I can listen to the music here. I can have different music in different rooms, and I can have it all set up so that it's really nice. And, and you know, we have balance in the family. Um, so I get all that stuff. And I get the, the smart home, the smart city, so the metering. Now, the question I want to ask you is, because it's an interesting question, is where's the router? What's the, or what's the biggest problem with the Internet of Things in the home and, and, and in those things? What is it? What's the biggest problem? You know, you get, you've got some things and they talk to each other. You know, your cooker and your Philips cooker and what have you, and your Philips TV talk to each other. What's the biggest problem? I've just given you a clue there, by the way. That's a good one. Standards. Are we having a de facto or are we having a de jure standard this time? Is it going to be an Americanism? Hey, we'll all get together and be friends for a while, and then pff, I've got a better one of those, so you need to take mine? Or are we going to go for... Going to have this right across the board, and we're all going to operate in the same way. How are we going to handle legacy? One of the things I've been thinking about, I'll give you it for free. Any of you want to go run with it? Why don't you have one router or one device in the home which takes control of all the others? Got it? You got one point. When you walk in, why don't you have a language, a set of commands? Like we did with mobile phones, where you, use, where you had a user API, which told you what, what this phone can do. I've got a screen this big. I can handle these commands. I can do this, this, this. We used to have a user profile that you used to have. It used to send to each phone, and it knew what it was, and it would know how to send you a picture in the right size, because we all had different size screens. It would know it could handle these controls on, off. It could, it could do vision pops. It could do those things. Why don't you... Have every device registered as a product on the internet with its set of commands that it can actually handle. And when you walk in and take out of the box this new product or walk into the house, that the router, when it registers it, says, new device, don't know what it is, hang on. It's got a user ID, it's a P1176. Flick up to the internet, because I'm connected to the internet, because that's what I do. Go find out what its profile is. Say, ha, I know what that does. And it can talk to that, the telly, the fridge, the duh, the duh, the duh, the duh, the duh, the duh, and talk to everything. Instead of Philips having their own, every frigging manufacturer of everything in the world having their own, some small clusters of people are playing nice for the moment until they can get competitive advantage over the others. And us having to buy all of one set of furniture, you know, do you have one style throughout the house? Why can't I have a Smeg fridge with a Zanussi washing machine with a da da da? Because that's the best deal for me to get and it's open. So, what we really need to do is work on writing that protocol and creating that image that everybody can use, not the ones that they're actually working on at the moment, which are actually divisive and controlling. And the discovery of a new device is a fundamentally the most important thing that ever happens. Because otherwise, everything you had before this new one is legacy. And you never know what legacy is. Because you, you don't know. So it's like camera accessories. You buy a new lens, you put it in the camera. Friggin' that doesn't work. I've just spent $1,000 on the lens. The camera was $400, uh, and it doesn't work. I've got to upgrade the phone. Trying to control that and that, that border, again, of ring fencing is wrong, fundamentally wrong. It's also counterproductive because it means it slower, slows up the, 
the rate at which Internet of Things will actually be accepted. It slows up our ability for individuals to make innovations and contribute to the main. Somebody pick a technology. So just pick something about the, about the blue. And think about how we think about how we actually integrate it. The, the, the reason is, I'm thinking of certain places. Oh, no, no, let's do it a different way. Where would you have this router? What's the device that you have in every home? What would you have as the, the core? Because actually, having a router is a redundant thing. Why would you have a router? Why would you have a router sat in the middle of there set by Cisco or by Dubai? Why wouldn't you just integrate it into something else? So give me a device. Would you have a television? Could you make your television the center of the, of the home? And then tell me why, yes or no. Anyone got any ideas? Good man. Straight to the face. Actually, there's two things. In a house, what you normally have is in most homes, in Western world certainly, you have a fridge. Fridge has got a big space in the back of it. It's got power going into it. It's got everything. You always have a fridge. It lasts for frigging years. It's cool. So slip into something cool, the fridge. Um, nah, yeah, yeah. And you probably won't, but you, what you try to do is make the roots. But no, the point I'm trying to make is you, are, you have it in something that's going to be in the house. It just comes as part of it. Actually, every fridge will come as one, with one. It doesn't matter. And, every, and, every, and, and they'll give you compatible. They'll figure it out. You, you're just going to embed it in something else so that you don't pay for the roots of standalone. The obvious one is the single point of entry to every home is that you have an electricity meter. And it can control things from there as well, because it actually can control directly down the current lines as well. If somebody would just get off their ass and solve the problem of uh, interference, and which is solvable, because I, again, in 1993, we were working on trying to send things down electricity lines you know, to, to homes and, and for pay, prepaid metering systems and GSM prepaid metering systems. Again, it's not new, it's just suddenly we have smart meters and we start calling them smart meters and we have little screens to look at it. It's not that smart. You know, just, we've been monitoring this stuff for ages and ages. But again, it is the place. I fundamentally believe that it's something like that that's going to be in every place because you can... The, the problem you've got is the, the last mile. The last mile to the house is where all of it you know, gets, gets cornered. You either have fibre or you have whatever it's going to come in. But then if you can get it into the meter, you can control things. You've got a guaranteed power supply. You can also work on monitoring things from outside and changing things from outside. There is an internet connection from it being built into most meters now uh, in local uh, clusters. So, because they're, they're trying to monitor the, the uses of electricity remotely, so they don't have to send a guy around to read your meter. So, it is a focal point. Also, when you plug something into a wall, it could be very directly connected to it in terms of switching it on and off. So, you can actually have area control. Or, you keep buying Hive and everyone else's that doesn't work with each other. And the next big one will come along and some because there's going to be an Amazon one and there's going to be a Google one and there's got because you know what you, you do know how this works it's exactly like it's exactly like airline societies <coughs> you have SAS which has got five or six airlines or ten airlines in it and you've got this and you actually go into clusters and so some people all have hives some people have this some people have that and and they'll all get behind it because they're all like trying to get in and get and get a competitive advantage or get acceptance. Whereas, you know what Bill Gates taught us? Bill Gates taught us that the most important part of his software and his success with Word, with Excel, with all of those other things, because when those products came onto the market, you know that there were de facto products in place. I mean, Lotus 1, 2, 3 was kind of nailed on the spreadsheet of all time for a good 10, 15 years. After VisiCalc, it became 1, 2, 3. And... Word and Excel, when they came onto the market, what they did is they did the innovative thing. I'll allow things to be imported into me, but I won't send things back in the opposite direction. So I only write Excel documents. But I'll accept an incoming 123 document. 
And in the case of the word processor, it was word perfect. Word perfect. And every one of these companies, Ashton, Tate, Lotus, and everybody, all thought they had the right to have a set of apps that were, you know, that were everything. Just because you're the best word processor in the world, you think you are also got a God-given right to have the best, to be able to do a spreadsheet, to be able to do a database. To be, the, I think was it Ashton Tate was the database with DBase. You know, everybody, there was one of everything. Harvard Graphics was the presentation package. Um, what Microsoft did, though, is they just said, hey, come in, come in, but you can't go out. And they gave it away and bought the market. And what, I, what Gates always said about that, his APIs in the operating system and so on is what made it, because people could write add-ons to it, people could do things to it. Having the API accessible, having people working to it, getting the body of people engaged with it, made it successful. Which goes back to the same thing that happened with the Apple, with its 300,000 users. Even though if you write a new app, your chances of being successful are a gazillion to one. Is it one... I don't know, there's something like, is it, is it something like 3,000 apps on the internet that are actually making any money? The rest of them are just vanity products. Or, or you know, they're, they're, they're interest products, they're there, they do things, but they're not making any money. And if you launch a new Apple product, you only get about five days to actually get 100,000 users or whatever to keep it up there, or whatever it is. But if after that, you just down the, the list, and if you search for it, you're about 57th on the list. So you're not going to really make a great killing out of that one either. Um, but Gates got it. Bill Gates got it right, or whoever he appointed, because he's very good at appointing the right people in the right places, got it, and they be believed that they could get this API that could be accepted, and those APIs got accepted, and the tools that came with it got accepted, and now it's the de facto standard across, and the one that we all call the great Satan. Of course, Google would like all of those, and Google's got all of its stuff online, which is not new, by the way, because the Google tools that are online are just like the Oracle tools that existed in 1990 when they had the computers that were... They went the other direction and said, hey, we just, just have a login. And actually, that was them on T, over TCP IP when you just had terminals and you actually had it all centrally located. And the cloud doesn't really anything new because, Christ, the cloud always was there. It just wasn't called the cloud and it wasn't as sexy and we didn't market it as nicely. And... You know, then we're talking about deep learning, and deep learning is an extension of the cloud and clever things and sexy, and it's deep, and it's learning, and it's meaningful. It must be, because we're all here, and we paid money to be here. And I drove five hours to be here. Christ, I'm the stupid one. Um, anyway, which brings me to a point. Are we all getting this so far? I mean, or I've just... It's not as clever as it's all made out to be, and, it's, and it means that what the opportunity is, that every one of us in this room has got an opportunity to affect it. Every one of us can come up with that killer app. Every, not, you know, it's not going to be a killer in that it's, it's going to be global mobile domination. Those come once or twice in a lifetime. But you've got the opportunity to do something, and you've got the opportunity to, set, to make a statement and to make things happen. All we've got to do is stay open. When I was drawing those boxes and things, I was just saying, just look outside. Just because it doesn't look like you can do it, maybe there's another way. And Romanians are really good. I mean, Christ, you're the best people in the world at doing it. You know, you have rules, and you have ways of getting around rules. You know? You have policemen, and you have ways of bribing policemen. You have whatever it is you have, and you have ways of getting around. And you're quite open about it. It's all right. I love my team. You know, my team says to me, I, went, I said, I'm going to buy a piece of equipment as a Rodin Swartz thing for 35000 The guy said, no, oh, but I don't bother. We can make one. Well, somebody can take the software from that and we can move it across. We can, we can do the same things with... It costs us 50 euro. And I went, OK. I, I, at first, I was, no, no, we'll get the one, we'll do it. We'll do it. In the end, I, nine years on, I'm kind of like, oh, it's OK. Well, it's, I know it'll make you feel, if it makes you feel better about it that you didn't spend money on it, that's OK. We'll, go there, we'll buy beer next time and, and we'll just enjoy it that way. But it is the way it is. You Romanians are the best in the world at innovating. I came here. And I'm going to kick off it, and I'll just tell you the end of my, the end of my story about how I got here um, and, and tell you something about yourselves, because I want to talk to you about you and why you can make a difference. <sighs> just put your hands up if you get bored. Oh, look. Okay. 
two things. First of all, just quick ones. Teams, they create the values. And the team delivers the value. And I owe everything that I've ever done, not to me, but to all those people. The teams, the teams that got it. The people who made it. And that's why I'm kind of talking to you guys. So I've done, oh, I don't know, shit. I've just done lots of things. Um, that, see that thing in the middle there? That was the first smartphone. Touch screen, email, all the bits and pieces. It's the first Simeon based smartphone. Um, took on the, uh, yeah, I did the blueberry and the blackberry, sorry, and the, uh, then the Motorola ones and, yeah, this, oh, this stuff. But I also coached sports teams and I coached military teams and taught people how to jump through windows. It's a very specific skill, it doesn't actually help you a great deal. Unless there's a fire. I'm good at that. Okay. Now, I have the most exciting job in the world. I just want to tell you that. I do now have the most exciting job in the world. I joined the company called Crossover. Some of you may have heard of it. Some may have heard some bad things about it. Some have heard good things about it. I joined them because I'd done all sorts of stuff. And a year ago, I wrote a paper for the CEO of it on how to make crossover work by changing its style and having co-location centers and having people working together and doing things and redesigning it. And then about six months ago, they contacted me and said, Barry, would you like to join us? Would you come on as senior vice president and will you come and do this? And I said, so what am I going to do? And they said, well, we bought 70 companies, software companies, and we buy one company a week. And what you need to do is figure out how we integrate those companies into our factory, take all the knowledge out of them, transfer it into knowledge-based articles so we can teach everybody else how to do it, resolve that you can solve all the problems and, and, and handle the, 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 the changes that we need and the software that we need to do with it, get them onto an, S, an SAS system so they can go into the cloud. And by the way, we don't have a double... We don't have three and four around the world. We have one big one, and it all sits in that, and you've got to keep it going. And then what you do with it is after that is we close the company as it was because it was losing money or it was making a small profit. So what we buy is we buy companies that have got, they've made sales, they've, they've got to a certain point, and we learn everything about that company and, and move it across. We, we would have taken the people, but the people don't, usually want to go, they want to take the money for, for being paid off, um, for, being, for buying the company, and they want to go somewhere else and do stuff. So we take it across, they don't want to work the way we work, and we put it into places like Romania, distributed with teams, and I have people in everywhere from the Philippines through Manila, through Malaysia, through India, obviously not China. Um, I have people in... Uh, Middle East, we have people in Romania and Czech Republic and Poland and all the Eastern European countries because that's the best thing for Europe. And then we have the South Americas, all of the, the, the economies. We have mostly people working from home. They work from home themselves in an office, in their home office. We have little drop-in offices that you can come to and spend time with. And what we do, and, and this is the bit that this is why I joined them to see to see whether this could be done is six months later, we make a 70% profit out of them. In six months. Just by cleaning out the infrastructure costs and all the offices and everything else. And just and we pay the people, what is it, an, an engineer, we pay $15 an hour, a senior engineer, $30 an hour, a manager, $50 an hour, vice presidents, $100 an hour. I get a lot of money. Um, no, I get $200 an hour. I get four hundred thousand. So they were throwing 400000 a year at me and saying, hey, come and do this. I just went... Yes, sounds like a good idea. At least I'll stay for a while and see what happens. And I don't know whether you can make this sustainable. So I talked to them about it. And they have this particular way of doing it and managing it. But after six months, these companies, which have got sales, are now making those same sales or more. And they have 70% less cost in them. And they're making a profit. And they're successful. And we keep them. We don't sell them. We just add them to the profile. And now we've got 78 companies. And I've got 17 in process of being coming in. And tell me how long it takes me to actually import one of these companies. So I study everything that it's got to be, do the due diligence. For, I'll tell you, the due diligence takes four weeks. We agreed to start by it. Then <clears throat> we have to move all of the engineering off. We have to 
we go through cleaning their code, making it so that it'll sit on, on a SaaS system, but we also optimize it because we actually run code tests on it and, and, and automatic, automated tests and improvements, and then we write software to, to fix it and make it work. We fix the customer service side of it and make sure that we've got that all in place. We move, maybe some of these things have got 10,000, uh, or no, say, say two or 3,000 a month the tickets coming in on them. A lot of them are quite big. They're from, they're from 5 million to about 500 million. 250 million is the biggest, I think. But, but usually sort of in the 20 to 100 million dollar range. And we import it. We use their guys to act as, in the first four or five weeks, to act as knowledge bases for us. We call them navigators, and we're the drivers. So we, they guide us where we've got to go, and we learn how to do it. Then we write the knowledge-based articles for them. It takes us two hours per knowledge-based article to write an article about how to solve a problem or how to do a particular thing. Duh, duh, duh. We put all of those in, and then how many weeks before we actually say to them, okay, thank you, bye, we're now ready to go. And it's in the factory, because I hand it over fully work. I test it for a few weeks to make sure it absolutely works in its own way, and I pass it over to the factory. How long do you think that takes? I'm just interested you know, to see what you think. We're all software engineers, we're all people in engineering. How many people think it takes 52 weeks? Okay, 40 weeks. Twenty-six weeks. Good man. See, he read the slide. Ninety days. Except it's not that. It's down to nine weeks. I am working to get it down to seven weeks. By the way in which we actually make it work, the way in which we actually learn from it. We're actually putting artificial intelligence in place to actually understand what the tickets are, analyze the tickets, put them into ticket types, and basically automate and, alternate and eliminate the, the issues. Also, what we're trying to do is to reduce all of the issues in there. So maybe it comes to us with 10,000 issues or 20,000 issues a year. When we hand it to the factory, we'll have cleaned out so that we fixed and they never come back, so we've eliminated them, or we've written knowledge-based articles and pushing down from L2 to L1, uh, because we're obviously going to be charged based on whether it's an L1 or L2, and we move it, we, we uh, automate any processes that we can, and I've just done the, the uh, SAS L2 room, and we've moved that down, one of those, we've moved down from by 50% in eight weeks by eliminating the stuff so it never comes back. The backlogs drop down to as, as well from 600 regularly down to, to like two, uh, sorry, to 80. So we're actually making them go away. And then we hand it across to the factory like that so that they can operate it easily or more easily. But the target, my target for my bosses, I forget what my target for my bosses. One week. Do it in one week. Why can't you do it in one week? Because what we do in this company is we set zero base targets. We push to the nth degree, and you just accept it. And he's, I, 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 I'll tell you what he says. He says, one week, and I say, go screw yourself. It can't be done. And then I think about it, and I think, okay, but I will make it as fast as I can, and I will experiment. And we're running 40 experiments at the moment across different projects to see if there's a, something that we can do that we can do better and get it crushed it down. And this is the final point that I was trying to get to you with. Something is about development. You know, if we make things better, easier to develop and better to develop and we sort out the problems of development, in three months, I reckon that we do the same as some other company does in change terms as they do in a year. One quarter, we can change anything we want in the way we do the process. We can, we can implement it. It's worked on a one-week basis. The guys, we have check-in chats with people every day. We talk to our people every day around the world and it works like a proper team but more efficiently because in actual fact it's very focused because you haven't got time to, you know, you can't walk. I, I mean, I used to in my other companies, I've always been a guy who walks in, shakes the guy's hand sits, and sits on it and says, how's it going? What are you working on? You know, duh, duh, duh. I used to have this ritual of 45 minutes to get to my desk, which just allowed me to talk to people. And when I got to my desk, I knew the five issues in the, in the room that I needed or the rooms that I needed to do as I walked through. 
what was the fun what was the issue and later in the day I need to find time for that 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 and that plus everybody in the room knew that I cared and that I was interested and that I was up to date and I went into meetings and I could talk to other senior managers about it and say hey my team's in this position we're on track we've got this I did it I've got these issues now if you do that and you communicate well if you actually set those goals we set for every team room we set goals which are metrics you know, something simple that everyone can do. And everyone in that room has the same metric to be measured on. And we rank and review based on performance against that metric. We change it from time to time, rotate it to, to, do, to deliberately focus on different things. But it's about taking, mic uh, not micro control, but taking control of what you're trying to achieve. And if you focus on IoT, we have to try, because we've got to try lots of different things, and we've got to, we've got to try and take the company and not just think about new clever technology. Oh, that's shiny. Let's go play with that. Let's think about what we do ourselves and how we act that better. How many people here in this room have got turgid processes in their company? Things that, Jesus, just get in the way of you doing anything quick. You know, can't make decisions. You've got to wait for it. I just do it. You know, my team, I talk to my team. I say, hey, guys. I came with this. So here's one. You know, we have people with, um, and it's a technology thing as well. We have people uh, who are agents, and they're working from home. So you've got to imagine there's guys in Hyderabad, there's guys in, who are wealthy, there's guys who are not so wealthy, there's guys who are working in a little cubby hole, there's guys, you know, we've all got a home office scenario that we've had. And you'd be embarrassed to see, see some of them. I mean, the lighting's not so good. So what we did is, I just said last week, I said, do you know what, guys? If we take two pieces of green card or a green backdrop and we drop it behind us, and we pick up a location, project it onto the screen behind us. You can do it in a lot of the, the, the video packages. You can do it in Skype. You can do it in Zoom. You can do it in things like that. Drop it in behind us. We send out T-shirts to everybody so everyone's got T-shirts so they look like they belong. Can you even have the company that they're importing on it or, or, or change the thing on the logo to say that? Now, the guys are allowed to come up with what we want. They can make it look like their own office. They can make it look like something else. All of a sudden, the professionalism that they look looks totally different, and they then get a better response from the customer, because the customer's looking at him going, hey, he isn't in his bedroom in the middle of nowhere, you know? And I did it, because I did it, I did it, I went to Australia last, I just came back last weekend. Um, I came back from Australia, and I worked in Australia, with a, with a boat drop behind me, and I worked on a boat in the Greek islands to, in September, with, you know, with, with, with a similar sort of scenario where I was able to work, and I was able to work, because every one of our people can work anywhere around the world. So as long as you've got two pieces of green card for a hotel room, so I'm up, sit, face your PC, you can project whatever you want onto you behind you. Nobody knows where you are, that's the next thing. Does it matter where you are in the world to actually do it? Because I'll tell you, six months on, when I first joined this company, and this is a new, this is an, this is a, an internet of things and moving on thing, I was like, no, I'm a confirmed. You've got to see people regularly. You need to do it. Thing, I brought all my VPs in and said to them, right, guys, forget about what the company rules are. You're all flying into Timisoara. We'll see you in Timisoara. We'll, let's get to go and see each other. At the beginning of this, I want to talk to you. So we did it. And it went very well. Since then, we've not met, met each other again. Yeah, I know. And we haven't met each other again. But now, six months on, I'm perfectly cool in front of a camera all day long doing calls 30 people in a call talking to each other around the world, or 10 people, and, and interacting and perfectly naturally. And I look like I'm in my office. I mean, I am in my office. I'm just comfortable and talking normally. And that is a small change now through the internet. In, you guys will not be working in an office, I swear, in a few years' time, because Google, Apple, all those guys are starting to do exactly that same thing and having people distributing. Because in the US, the commute is a one and a half hour commute. Either way, and people would die to work from home. So we need to even think about that, that the way we work is going to change over that time. Anyway, I'm being given the, because I've got to go. Ah, uh, let me just see if there's anything else I want to tell you, just very quickly. Ah, uh, just wanted to say, this is for you. This is my goodbye to you. I did a six-month study, 47 countries around the world, to find the best location in the world to work for engineering. Right? I spent six months on it. I analyzed it. I analyzed India, China, all the places. Started with the top 
gr group of people, went to, Google, uh, went to various other people and analysed where it was go. And then I put a, a spreadsheet together with 40-odd questions about command and control, about people, about the cost, about all the things, about where you can work. Right? Based it on the US and Britain saying that that was kind of cost-wise and, and so on, that would be what you were actually doing. What typical Western European and the US, because that's what you're going to be working against, right? So, guess what? The Eastern European bloc on that straight line, best place in the world to get it. Command and control inside the, the EU, so any of the countries inside of the EU, you've got free movement, you've got all that stuff that you can do there, plus the level of technical skills, the level of English, the actual three best places in, that we found, Romania, Czech Republic, and, and Poland, the truth of the matter was the company ended up choosing going to Romania, right? And we went to Timisoara. Could have been Cluj, it could have been Yash, it could have been... Well, it wouldn't have been Bucharest. Um, but it could have been any of the others. <laughs> I'm from Timisoara, for Christ's sake, Bucharest haters. I mean, it's not, it's not even... They're still not forgiving us for the revolution. Certainly the PSD haven't, anyway. Um, that's just to show that I get the local situation. Um, but look at it, and you can see where the others are, are just, the, the, the ambers are where intermediate maybe get better in the future. But look at the big two, China and India, and I'm just going to give you a bit. You are the only country in the world who can take these guys on. Technically, language-wise, skills-wise, Price-wise, you are still in the point that you could actually be competitive. They still have to have three to, you know, it's not three to one like it is in England against them. Two things. China is the worst place in the world to build software. I owned 20,000 guys in China, right? Oh, that's telling me, time to go off. Um, I owned 20,000 guys in China. Shanghai, Shenzhen, uh, uh, Xi'an and Beijing. It was awful. And I'll just give you the anecdote, it's very quick. You all prepared to stay just a few minutes? Just watch it? Okay? Not gonna run? Okay. So, the thing about Chinese, deal's never done. The negotiation for it is never over, the contract is never signed. Secondly, in China, they have this nasty habit of not being able to say no. Every team I send, even in Romania, I send my teams on, on coaching courses to teach them how to say no. So they can basically say no to me. Because if I come with something stupid, I want them to tell me it's no, you can't do it in that time, but we can do this, 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 and this. China, they'll just go, yes, 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 yes. And you go to them after the unrealistic target they've accepted, and you go to them a month later and say, we seem to be about 20% down on where we were going to be there. Oh, it's okay, so it's okay. We'll catch up. We put more work on it. We'll, we'll work longer. Oh, God, it's all. And you go three months and you say, I'm getting a bit nervous now, guys. It's three months in. It's a nine-month project. And we're, we're nearly 25% behind. Uh, are we going to, oh, no, no, no. We'll catch up in the second because we'll do this. And we're going to put more people on and we're going to work harder. And, we'll and now the team's now working 10 hours a day instead of eight hours a day. And it, it'll get better. So you get inevitably towards the picture, you get to, to th the three months from the end stage. Oh, no, no, it's okay, it's okay, we're, we're doing fine. We, we've got now 150 guys on it, and they're working 20 hours a day. And, do, 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 and you get to two weeks before it, and you say, guys, we've got 20% of this project that's still not delivered. And they go, no, no, it's okay, it doesn't look like that. It's just, it, it's just a thing about testing and so on, it's just not come through. And, but now we're working 26 hours a day. We're working 26 hours a day, and there's 5 million people working on it, and the Red Army's going to come in next week, and that's going to make a big difference, and it's going to be fine. And then you get to the day where it's supposed to deliver, and you sat there, and it arrives. In fact, it doesn't arrive. And you go the next day, and you say, and they say, oh, so sorry. So sorry, I made a mistake. So you go, um, okay, so what is it going to be? Can you give me another day? Is it going to be a week? Is it going to be, yeah, four months. Okay, that was a surprise. And the same thing with the money, in the reverse. So I've been done deals with them where they go, you get the call three, months, two, three weeks before you're about to ship to them. Uh, oh, so bad, so bad. Can't, can't sell this product. It's not possible. It's... it's it's out of date now. It's no, it's too late. I, I, I can't possibly do this. It's not, not a 
can't do it. Can't do it. No. No, it's, it's, not, it's no good. It's no good. It's rubbish. It's, it's, we need big, more features, more everything. Uh-huh. So I have this habit with them of saying, and I did it the first time, and I got my Chinese compatriot with me as a sales guy, and he almost chokes on his, he chokes on everything. We were building a phone for somebody, and the, this guy did this trick, and I just looked at him and said, yeah, you're right. Bad business for you, bad business for me. Yeah, we'll pull the plug on it. We'll stop it now. Uh, I won't give you any more software, and, and you guys just, you take your cost, we'll take our cost. Yeah, it's, it's a loss. It's a, no, 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 no. So sorry, so sorry, so sorry. You misunderstand. I didn't say that. I said, no, I actually know exactly what you said. You, what you said is, I want a 25% cost down on it, and I want you to actually bear the basis of it, and I want you to deliver what I want. I said, that's not acceptable. And of course, then they never pay your bills. So you actually put bombs in the software so it stops working after 30 days. And you find out they shipped it and it's got a bomb in it and it stops working. They go, oh, uh, so sorry, you, um, you, the software's not working. It's not working. Oh, yeah, what, you shipped with that software? But you knew that wasn't the final release. Oh, well, you know, uh, we did it. Oh, sorry. Well, we, it only works for 30 days. Oh, what are we going to do? Well... Actually, I can't do anything because you haven't paid us the last half a million dollars that you're supposed to pay us. Um, oh, it'll be paid. And like 20 minutes later, there's a, there's a draft, copy of a banker's draft coming to you saying, hey, we're paid and it's all good. Let's go. Which is kind of why you can't rely on China. And I'm not, I'm, you know, that might sound as though I'm very simplistic, but I've been working with China for 25 years and it never changed over the whole. I've done that so many, that dance so many times. And the Indians, the reason they can't do it is they've got half a million shortfall in software engineers. They're doing all the Chinese software engineers because software engineers in China are not valued. They're a piece of... Hardware engineers are valued because it's, it's about selling components and putting things together. But software engineers don't, don't get a lot of value. And so they don't, they're not very good. As a, they're not getting as good as the results. So the Indians are now... They're outsourcing the work to, to India. India are opening universities to qualify new people so they can fill the jobs that are coming in. So what kind of, you know, when you get done, you know the old thing, you, 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 when you meet the consultant, the guy who's the head of the company, he tells you, hey, we're going to do this for you, you're going to do that for you. And then you get the guy who's just read the book and he's, he's kind of one page ahead of you in the book. That's, that's what's happening in India at the moment. They haven't got enough people. And the cost is going up because the people want to be managers now. And they want to, they've been doing the cheap stuff for ages, now they want to be managers. Plus, when you work with outsourcing in India, you better spend twice or three times as much on design and, and, and monitoring the project because otherwise they'll build something totally that you didn't want but that they thought it would look nice to build. So you have to make sure all your designs are everything. And it, and it is a fact. It's just, it's just one of those things. It's just the way it is. They, the real best, they, they, if, they, if you don't give them the information and you don't make it very clear to them, they will build what they think, which is fair enough. It's not, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, I'm just saying it is fair enough. So, you work in one of the best locations in the world to be kick-ass in this world of software, and this world of IoT, in this world of new technologies, in this world of deep, whatever we're in. Um, it's not deep, guys. It's fairly shallow. And it's, but it is broad, and it can be many things. And there's a, there's a, I'd love, I wish I was starting my career again, because I've probably only got another 20 or 30 years doing this, but... Um, you guys, a lot of you have got, have got a whole lifetime ahead of you doing this, and you're going to see things, you know, that curve that goes is going to go even higher. And I wish you a great deal of luck of it. And if you have you been, thank you for listening. <laughs>